of urges is really born out of this um, objective of getting really granular and of collecting data on yourself. So when you think about um, an urge, it typically lasts for 15 minutes. Um, it peaks at that point is typically when you engage with it and then it will subside. So you know, even a d distraction is helpful because it pulls you out of that um, moment of, of the, the, the peak intensity. And then a lot of people in early recovery will not necessarily notice they have an urge. So they'll be mid-binge and then they'll say, oh, I've let this happen yet. I can't believe I let this happen yet. So we call the choice point this moment of awareness. And you want to pull it forward so that you start to get aware of the inkling of an urge before it's fully in control of you. Let's link up with Krista on The Fix. She's a wellness coach with a focus on mental well-being and physical strength. listeners, welcome back to our latest episode of The Fix Podcast. I'm your host, Krista Huber, and I am joined by an extremely impressive, well-spoken, incredible guest today who is doing really meaningful work, and that is Emily, who is the founder of Juniver, a fascinating app that is just providing really accessible access, but a very different take on how to support people who want to work on their relationship with food, specifically around eating disorders and disordered eating. Now, that entire topic can be interpreted in so many different ways and can be a bit of a loaded phrase. But what I love about this conversation and what I love about Juniver and the mission of the company, as you'll hear within the first few minutes of this episode, as El Emily just way more eloquently than I possibly could does go ahead and describe, is really changing the stigma around disordered eating and really more so around the relationship with food. There are so many parallels to the approach that Juniver is taking that apply to the way we see behavior change inside of the fitness fix. And I really see this organization and the services and support that they're providing as such a fantastic compliment to anybody out there who wants to dip their toe in the water of working on your relationship with food. What's really cool. You'll hear me say this at the very end, but I think it's important to address in the very beginning of this episode too, is the fact that it's, less than $8 a month. So such a low barrier to entry, something that would be a great thing to try for you to just educate yourself more, even on the neuroscience behind food and why we, and, and behavior change and how we can really rewire our brain. I learned a ton as you will hear about research when it comes to looking at the female population in particular and I'm just excited to see Juniper grow the way it's integrating technology, like artificial intelligence. We get into that as well. And I think there's just a ton of valuable information in this one. So I'm going to turn it over to Emily and can't wait to hear the feedback. Enjoy. Emily, welcome to the Fix Podcast. I'm so excited to have you today. So excited for you to be a part of the Fix platform and share more about Juniver. And before we get right into it, I have a little icebreaker question that I think you probably know since you told me you listened to a few episodes. So what is your go-to coffee order? What do you like to sip on in the morning to get your day started? Thanks for having me. It's so fun to be here. Um, my coffee order is espresso, really espresso nice. all day long. I drink caffeine um, pretty late into the day. Okay. How late? Like what's your cutoff time? Four or five. And you still go to sleep at night? Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Well, it affects everybody differently. The half-life of caffeine for most people is like eight hours. So that's why I usually ask, but I guess it doesn't affect you. I think it's probably because I drink so much of it, so but much it, of it. <laughs> yeah, not the recommended amount, I guess, but that's um, okay. something I, I rely big, on. Reason for the question is because I'm a big coffee girl myself. I've tried yeah. to change the amount that I drink because it was affecting my sleep, but assuming that you drink espresso, I would imagine that it's because you're a purist for like the taste of coffee. Mm, like well, I love it. Yeah. Same. I really enjoy the taste of it. Yeah. Um, tea doesn't quite do it for me and milk and coffee. No, not for me. Yeah. Well, we're on the same page. Cool. 
So we're going to move into the deeper direction right out of the gate here. And we'll get into exactly what Juniper is, more on your background, how your own personal path and as well as your career kind of led you to where you are right now and everything that you're doing. But beyond that standard 30 second elevator pitch that you could give us about your resume and your background and all those sorts of things, I'd really love to know and would love for the fixed listeners to be able to hear from you. Who is Emily at her core? And on top of that, why should we care about what you have to share with us in the rest of this episode? Yeah, I love that question. It's such a good starting point, too. And it's an important right reminder to always start there, you know, with the yeah. fundamentals. I care really deeply about helping people reach and live their potential. And, and in particular, through recovery, because getting from a place of being unwell, which I've been and many have been, to a place where you can thrive is really like going from, a, you know, li- life in black and white to life in color. And so helping people through that journey has been really incredibly meaningful. I love that. Also- and I love it so yeah. much. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I also will add that I'm a creative person and I'm a problem solver. And so, uh, you know, company building has been really fun. It's been hard as well, but it's been fun because you're always solving problems and you have to get creative. So it's been, um, it's been, it's been a great few years. Amazing. Well, let's expand on that second point because I know your background and I think it's really interesting and you don't necessarily have a traditional career path, which I haven't either. So we can obviously relate on that. I'd love for you to talk about that. And of course, as you see fit, you know, weave in maybe a little bit of your own personal story and how that's really influenced what you're now doing today. Yeah, absolutely. So I started a company called Juniper, and we're a digital therapeutic for eating disorders. And so we cover the whole spectrum. So eating disorders really exist on a, on a wide spectrum. So some people will have what's called disordered eating, and some will have a more acute um, diagnosed eating disorder. And so we help people across that spectrum really overcome urges when they present. So our program has a content curriculum that's rooted in the science of habit formation, We have a toolkit that people can use across the day to plan for their recovery or in the moment of urges. And then we have a moderated peer community. And we recently launched an AI chat to help you overcome urges and do a range of other things. But um, we see people mostly using it for urges as expected. And and that's been um, helping them get better. So we're seeing a lot of symptom reduction and improved clinical outcomes. We're running a clinical trial at the moment with King's College. So overall, you know, our, our, our program can be used independently of treatment, or it can complement um, your therapy appointment if you're seeing a therapist or um, an IOP program. We have we have some of our members in, in different levels of care, um, but we, we, we address that in the moment need of, of having a compulsion. Yeah. And what I think is really interesting about we could probably do the entire episode on this. So let's st- we can stay on this topic and then move into yeah. a few other things. But this whole idea around changing like the stigma associated with yeah. eating disorders or disordered eating, I would love for you to kind of unpack that a little bit more because in the first conversation that we had when we were introduced a few weeks ago, I was really intrigued by that because I never thought about that before. Like when you think about, a a stereotypical definition of an eating disorder. You mentioned to me, a lot of people think primarily about anorexia and that doesn't even begin to cover, unfortunately, the span of what that might look like. So can you just kind of go into that in a little bit more detail and what you all are doing with this concept around urges and how that might relate to, you know, like binge eating and what you just mentioned about disordered eating, because I see a ton of that in the work that I do. Yeah, I bet. Um, you know, the, even the term disordered eating, some people would find that confronting, might not sure. identify with that. And so we really, we say, if you want to change your relationship with food, try us out. And that covers a whole spectrum of people. Totally. To your point about yeah, disordered eating and eating disorders, this, the anorexic patient who's typically young, female, white, and very underweight, that is 6% of the eating disorder population. Wow, so the that's vast, it? Yeah. I the didn't vast know. Majority of, yeah. 
the vast majority are in bodies like yours and mine. You know, eating disorders are invisible for the majority of cases. Um, so we really want to, you know, improve outcomes. The outcomes we can touch on that too. And clinical care are typically um, low, and so we want to improve that efficacy. And also we want to improve access so that people can access the care they need when they do seek help. <clears throat> and and fundamentally, we also want to change the conversation around eating disorders because. As you pointed out, you know, there's a huge amount of shame and stigma, um, which delays access to treatment and lowers the expected outcomes. So we want to really encourage people who want to change their relationship with food or their relationship with their body to really um, reach out and, and get the help they need quickly. Um, so we, we deliver that right now in the form of an app that's available on the app store. So you can really download it on your terms and, and you don't have to jump through hoops and, and speak to your teacher or your parent or your friend mm -hmm. about the problem. You really can, can, can get it quickly without, without having to do that. Um, and then the other, you know, we, we, we also touched on this in our past conversation, but lived experience is, is, you know, very much at the heart of our team and what we've built. And, and, and that comes across. I think our members feel that, we know what eating disorders are, um, and that's that's been a, a big part of our uh, mission with Juniper too, is to really speak ourselves of our experience so that people can feel empowered and recognized also. You know, it's not just, yeah, it, it's very isolating to have an eating disorder typically, and so we really want to um, empower people to speak up about it if they're comfortable doing so, and certainly to find a community of others who've mm. been through, who've been there, and who who, who know what it's like. Yeah. And I think it's a pretty complex thing because it just goes back to that phrase of relationship with food. Mm -hmm. I I've had this conversation with my own nutrition coach. He's been on this podcast a few times and has said this, like we sh need to look and understand food from the place of recognizing that it is like a drug. And the challenge with it is unlike, as he said, you know, cocaine or heroin food you need to survive. <laughs> And so taking that idea, and I think in a lot of ways that can reduce some stigma around having a poor relationship to it. And then from my perspective, what I find is the other tricky part of it for people is nobody ever really teaches you how to eat. Like when you yeah. really think about it, your parents or whoever raised you could have a, even just in school, like that's a whole nother can of worms. And I think something that you guys are looking to change, but you, somebody just puts food in front of you. And yeah. then even if they have the best intentions, like we could come up with so many anecdotes of like the, Hey, like you need to finish what's on your plate so that you can have this dessert. Like people aren't thinking about what that may do psychologically to a four-year-old in kind of telling them, don't listen to your hunger cues sort of thing. Yeah. And yeah. like treating foods as rewards. Like you could make yourself kind of crazy, like over analyzing the word choices that you're using. So I want to be super clear here. Everything I'm saying is like, not because I think anybody had bad intent. It's just like, we didn't know. Right. And then yeah. what happens is you, let's say go off to college or you navigate living on your own. And now all of a sudden it's like, Oh, you are the one making these decisions Yeah, coupled with entering the real world, figuring out life. And it's like very it's makes a lot of sense for food to become a coping mechanism. And then for all the ladies out there, I can just say on a very personal level, like I feel that if I were to categorize points of the month where I may feel like I would have an episode that I would consider an urge or a binge totally around my cycle, because all of a sudden I feel like I'm starving. And I'm like, I go through these periods where I'm like, I just can't stop eating this thing could be related to stress. Like there's so many things we could point to. This absolutely with you there. There's very little education on how to eat and what to eat. And then, you know, we're also in a culture that, you know, that we could qualify as a diet culture where, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a real focus on being slim and that's um, considered, you know, it's, it's a, a sense of worth is attributed to your size, which totally is you know, will, will, will definitely lead to some disordered eating behavior in some cases. And we really take the point of view that a disordered eating and, and, and eating disorders in general are a mental health condition. So it's not about weight. It's really, it manifests in your life and in your brain, like an addiction. So to your sure. point on- And control, control, I think is yeah. what I hear a lot too. Yeah. 
Exactly. Um, so you're either restricting, you're purging if you purge, or you're um, binge eating, um, because typically, I mean, there are a number of different um, uh, factors that contribute to the development of, a, of an eating disorder, but you're typically um, in, engaged in something that feels compulsive, and that's pattern building. And so mm -hmm. to do that, um, what's really important is two things. One is to do something different when an urge hits. So you would, instead of engaging with your behavior, uh, choose a tool to help you uncover if your urge is for food or for an, meeting an emotional need, and we help you do that. So it's doing something when an urge hits that will pivot you away from your default behavior. And the other thing is really to think about progress at a micro level. Instead, you know, typically in eating disorder, uh, uh, in our members with, with eating disorders and disordered eating, um, there's a, a more of a binary perspective, which is, you know, oh, I slipped and I'm back to square one. Like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm such a failure. There's a lot of self, mm -hmm. self criticism in green. And so trying to undo that really happens through understanding progress can be you incorporate protein for breakfast, you know, or yeah. instead of um, skipping a meal, if you've binged and your definition of binge is very subjective potentially, but you know, you consider you've binged, you, instead of spending the day um, drinking iced coffee, you're going to have a meal plan that's going to be pretty similar to what you would have done if you hadn't binged. So really to think about progress at that micro level to, to continue engaging with recovery, even in challenging moments. Absolutely. And that's where I just feel like there's so much alignment in terms of the approach that we take inside of the fitness fix with working with our clients, because I say this all the time, like you wouldn't necessarily go on Instagram and see this because it's not the sexy thing to market, but what we're really teaching our clients is behavior change. And yeah. it's the most important piece of that, I believe, is what you just mentioned about what are we replacing the pattern with? Like, if you truly want to break a pattern, it will never, ever work for you to be like, just stop doing that thing. Like, yeah. Let's really get to the root cause of one, why are you doing this in the first place? Is it because of what we've touched on around self-worth, value, the way you see yourself? Um, something else I hear from people I work with or just conversations I have with potential clients is a lot of like shame around actually using food and ultimately their weight as a way to hide because they don't want to be seen. So sometimes there's this fear around actually pursuing fat loss for their health because it's like, this was a protection mechanism and that's manifested through their relationship with food too, which is, I think something that doesn't get highlighted enough either, but I hear a lot. And, you know, ultimately the difficult part is when somebody is trying to pursue some sort of fat loss or improvement of relationship with food. And ultimately we can blanket all that to describe it as a better relationship with food, but just overall better health, right? Yeah. You're met with all these quick fixes and different things that don't actually help you change how you see yourself and really change who you are like that true identity shift. So I'd love for us to kind of get into a little bit more detail about what you mentioned about some of the content that's included in the curriculum um, and, you know, the different features inside of the app. And as a second question to that, I just want to say this so I don't forget it. I'm very interested how your team landed on using the word urges as a part of, you know, the experience and like why that was selected, because I would assume there was some thought put into that too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, great questions. Um, and maybe I'll start out answering uh, a, a couple of points that you raised. Sure, that are so please. I think in terms of, you know, hormonal health and impacts on eating behavior and, and you know, what you're, what you bring from your past into your Absolutely. present. And, yeah. And what we invite people to do, which I, you also do so well, is really think about it as almost data points. You know, what do you, what are you learning about yourself in a, set you up for success. So totally. it's, it's about, okay, these contexts, I'm more vulnerable. So we have a tool called, we have a, a feature called, um, micro goal setting. So you look at your day ahead, you first scan your body, you know, how am I feeling physiologically? Am I a five out of 10 this morning? Am I, you know, did I get enough sleep? Um, did I binge last night? Whatever it is, you know, you show up with your whole self, where yeah. am I at? And then 
what are the moments in my day that might be really tricky? Um, and that could be, you know, I'm having lunch with my mom, or it could be I'm giving a big presentation today. And then you think through, okay, in that moment, maybe that's going to trigger me to have this behavior that I want to change. And instead of doing that, what I'm going to try is to do this. And then we'll engage with you at that moment to really support you through it. But it's about building these new habits, as you say, around what you already bring, you know, what you know about yourself to inform how you're going to show up in that vulnerable moment. Because what we want to avoid is to wake up on Monday morning and think, you know, oh, this week's going to be so different. And in fact, mm -hmm. you're going to be the same, right? So yeah. how can we really empower you to make different choices when it matters? Um, to your point on the curriculum, so we built a curriculum that's rooted in the neuroscience of habit formation. And so it's very cool. different from what you might, you know, get in a weight loss program, which some of our uh, members are prescribed, but it's, um, you know, to really help educate you on where an eating disorder comes from and what to do about it today. So really looking at our brain has learned this behavior. Why is it that a binge feels so good? It felt like a reward. Mm. Yeah. Um, for so long? Why does it feel so good when I'm in it? And why can't I stop doing something that lands me in a place where I feel really unwell, really unhappy, and, um, and, and, and desperate for change. So we really help you think through this is why this behavior has occurred. And this is why it feels so hard to overcome it. And then the next part of the curriculum is really around what can you do about it today in, in practical ways? And so we look at, um, of course, you know, food. How do you want to engage around food? What do you want to think about when you have urges? What can you do differently instead of following through with it? And also how to think about other things in your life that will impact your intake or your relationship with food. So for example, you know, some people need a little bit of education around emotional fluency. It's sometimes hard for people with disordered eating and eating disorders to think through, I'm feeling a really hard emotion right now and I kind of need to sit through it and feel it. Uh, instead, you know, we'll, we'll lean to food. So having the, you know, building um, emotional resilience is very much part of the program. And also boundary setting. So some relationships may need to change as you're recovering your, you know, an, an improved relationship with food. You might want to also, you know, learn how to say no to certain things. And what does that look like for you if you've typically been, you know, quote unquote, a people pleaser. So thinking through all the aspects of your life that would potentially impact your relationship with food. And then we also touch on nutritional counseling in a way that's not prescriptive. So we'll really lean into certain, you know, certain meal planning, for example, is, 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 is really the goal when you start your recovery because intuitive eating is something you can't do if you've lost your um, hunger and fullness signals. So we really set some ground rules as to how you want to think about creating your meal plans, but we're not going to tell you what to eat because it's really, um, you know, subject to so many uh, different uh, choices, but we'll have a lot of content around blood sugars, um, how to, you know, plan your snacks, how to think about what enough looks like when you Great. don't know that. Um, and then we'll also have a lot of content around what to plan for during the holidays, what to plan for um, when you're traveling, really practical guides um, that support you in those moments. And then lastly, some reminders about, you know, what you well, you want to look forward to. I think that's also really important is to hold that really close is that what, what is recovery for you? What does, what, what's on the other side and to mm -hmm. keep, um, to, to keep that vision, um, very, very close to, to your, to your immediate horizon. I love it. It's one of the things that really just like stood out to me there and what you mentioned, is of course the last piece around, you know, what do you want to look forward to? I think that's where that goal setting piece comes in. Right. And for so long, an individual who's feeling this way and, and feels challenged by this relationship to food, so much of their goal was around looking a certain way rather than feeling a certain way. Right. So yeah. if we can reset those goals to be like, okay, how do I want to feel? And then in addition to that too, the behavior piece and those pattern changes, the way I like to think about that is 
if somebody is looking to change their relationship with food, ultimately you're really actually looking to change your relationship with yourself and be more in touch with yourself. And if it happens that fat loss or taking care of your health in a different way is your goal, if you can prioritize yourself, which includes feeling those full range of emotions, because I think that's such a big one. And I love that that's incorporated into the entire experience because I feel like for any person, if you dig into it with them, that's exactly what they're not doing. Like they want to avoid. And that's where food or even scrolling on your phone, right? Like that's where all of that comes in. And I've been on that journey myself this year. So I know that's why it's standing out to me, but in going through that personally, it's made me realize there's such a domino effect. It's like everything actually becomes easier. If you're the person who always feels like, oh, I'm too busy. And then you're not prioritizing eating. And then all of a sudden you're starving. What does that lead to? Right? Like if you can shift your entire mindset of saying, I'm not too busy. I want to rearrange my time so that I can prioritize myself. There's a domino effect on the result that you're actually looking for. And it doesn't then have to feel so hard to be able to accomplish it. Absolutely. And there's, you know, so much of what you said resonates, including, you know, needing to make a choice around some of the things that are going to have to give, you know, we're all busy and, and, and it's, it's, it's really hard to do all the things, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a world that asks a lot of us, some of us are moms, some of us work Mm -hmm. and parent, and some of us have to take care of older parents there's just a lot on our plates. And so how we engage with food is going to potentially come with a trade-off in terms of other things in your life that you're juggling. And so I like to invite people to think about what they will not, um, what, what they'll hold on to and protect. So in, in particular through recovery, you know, there are some things that are going to make recovery really challenging or going to make it really hard to overcome an urge when it, sh- when it shows up. Mm. So it might be sleep. That would be something that we would probably recommend that you prioritize. So yep. if it's, you know, sleep versus exercise, go for the seven hours instead of the six, you know, mm-hmm. because that might t- tip you into like a more resilient mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, so think about your, you know, what you, what you won't touch. That's your, you know, that's your protected space. And that means that you might not be able to see girlfriends, you know, five nights in a row because you're not, you're not going to get the sleep that you need. Um, or it might mean, you know, I'm, you're going to forego alcohol for a little bit because that's what's going to, you know, that's, what's going to make you more resilient because you've noticed in the morning, otherwise you're feeling down and it's going to, you know, it's, spiral into something like disordered eating. So think about what are the things you absolutely will hold on to and protect. And it doesn't have to be everything. In fact, it shouldn't be everything because then immediately you're going to set yourself up, not for success, but for failure. So choose what is going to be your, your precious thing that you're going to guard. Um, and then build around that what's feasible and it's not, yeah, it's, it's, it, be realistic, you know, don't decide that you're going to home cook all your meals or that you're not going to, you know, eat certain foods at certain times. So you really, you know, give yourself some flexibility, even within your meal plan, if you're in recovery and following that. Absolutely. And just to give an example of this, I had a client recently, we had this conversation and we've been working together for a while. And to your point that you made earlier about really trying to collect data to make more informed decisions, not only are we collecting data inside of the fitness fix around like, you know, hours slept, digestion, hunger cues, weight, all that, but around like the patterns of what may be causing the behavior you are trying to move away from. And in this person's case, she noticed that she would have a ton of structure all day and feel really great until she got to a point where she had put her child to bed and then she wanted to unwind and watch some TV. There is an association with when watching TV, I have to have a snack. Like that was like the thing in her head. And it usually resulted in her feeling like she was eating way more than she wanted to based on the goals that she had. And so I said to her, I'm like, what's the value of why you're watching TV? Because there's a reason why you're doing it. Like, I'm not saying we need to like stop watching TV, but like, it's not about the TV. It represents something else for you. And it's a way for her to decompress at the end of the day. 
So instead of us saying like, we need to just like cut off the time we're eating or close the kitchen or like phrases like that. And even actually including some of those snacks, because we've taken that approach too to add and operate from a place of abundance, not subtraction or restriction. I asked her, I was like, what if we replaced the TV piece? Like if it's because you like to decompress, could you go read a book or something like that? So she's like, you're right. That's a good point. So we tried it for a week and we replaced that TV time with going and reading a book and like doing it in bed. So like you're getting into that routine to unwind has had no issues since like just making that change. Yeah. And it's because of the association with those two things. And she feels so much better. And in her mind, she's like, oh, like this makes so much more sense now. And I think it's removed a lot of the shame from it too. Absolutely. Well, congrats on identifying that yeah. for her to change it. It was amazing. We we also see that, um, you know, we, we we think about, we look at the environment too, and you're right to the, point out like the daily habits that are associative and, and invite people to think about the way they would engage with their closet. So looking at, okay, this, this no longer fits me or I don't like mm-hmm. this top anymore. Um, this looks great. Let me repurpose it. So really to to go through one's environment, one's sure. routine, see what works and what might need revamping. And, and that could be a really creative exercise. You know, it could be actually, you know, I'm not, I typically go home and I pass the supermarket and I always get my binge foods on the way. And instead of doing that, I'm going to take a different route. I'm not going to go through that way, but I'm going to have really cool snacks waiting for me at home because the idea of dry popcorn is not appealing and that's right. not going to help. And that's popcorn. okay. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, making these small changes can have a really big impact and invigorate you. That's the other thing that I think is really important is that when you start noticing that these things are possible and you start witnessing for yourself, wow, I have more energy, I feel capable, that can really also snowball into positive. Mm -hmm. Now, how does the whole term of like tracking urges fit into what you just mentioned about the positive piece and like removing some of that judgment? Urges, to your your question on urges, we did a lot of research and we had really three options that we were looking at. One was the word craving. The other was urge and the, uh, the third one, compulsive moment. Urges can be confronting. I think a lot will, will you know, in the in the, in the broader uh, space, probably associate more with cravings. However, we felt that people, and this is confirmed by the research we did, we conducted, um, people with disordered eating and eating disorders feel the 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 craving is overpowering. So craving, they felt, and and we 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 felt as well that it wasn't truly representative of the experience of Mm. having this overwhelming desire to compulsively overeat or to purge in the case of, 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 of those who do. So it, we, we, we landed on that just to honor the experience. Um, a craving felt, um, you know, very consistent with probably what everyone has once in a while. I crave, you know, a snack or um, an urge is stronger. And so we wanted to, to, we landed there. Compulsive moment was a little bit of a, of a mouthful. Um, it won't, you know, with, with those things, I think it's, it's, we invite people to not get stuck too much on the word, even though word mm-hmm. choice is so crucial to get right. Um, if people don't feel that it completely captures their experience, um, there's still value in progressing through the program and engaging with uh, the tools if they're useful to you. Um, so the, the the tracking of urges is really born out of this um, objective of getting really granular and of collecting data on yourself. So when you think about um, an urge, it typically lasts for 15 minutes. Um, it peaks at that point is typically when you engage with it. And then it will subside. So, you know, even a d- distraction is helpful because it pulls you out of that um, moment of, of the, the, the peak intensity. And then a lot of people in early recovery will not necessarily notice they have an urge. So they'll be mid binge and then they'll say, oh, I'd let this happen again. I can't believe I let this happen again. So we call the choice point, this moment of awareness. And you want to pull it forward so that you start to get aware of the inkling of an urge before it's fully in control of you. Um, And so tracking urges for us is the ability to giving the ability to our members to really get 
a little bit more introspective about their physiological experiences. It also helps you map out your triggers. So if you start to notice when urges come up for you, you're able to really detect some patterns in your life. And so it enables you, again, to get data, to feel more empowered to make choices that are going to sustain you. That makes a ton of sense. And I think this is a good segue to also ask you about something you mentioned at the very beginning around lived experiences and also like efficacy of recovery. I love for you to shed a little bit of light on how there is a need for the type of support that Juniper is offering versus maybe like past more traditional methods of recovery. And the one that I could think of, like in thinking about somebody, you know, going into like more of like a treatment facility or something like that. I know from talking to friends and, you know, even like media coverage, I've seen of this, something that always was kind of puzzling to me is you're not integrated into like your real life routine when you're going through that. And I know there's such an emphasis in in the case of, let's say, anorexia or bulimia of measuring your progress of like, we need to get this individual to gain weight. And yes, I understand that it's for health reasons, but I would imagine that's probably a difficult transition when you mm-hmm. then are, you know, going back into your quote unquote real life, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, and so the lived experience, I had a long history of eating disorders and I'm recovered now and I really tried so many different treatment modalities. And what I felt um, my my problem was, was really urges and that I didn't get any support through them. And Mm -hmm. that's what I continued to battle regardless of what treatment I was in was, you know, these really strong moments of compulsion that felt so overpowering. And ultimately, um, while I'm sure the treatment I was in collectively contributed in some form to my overall recovery, what proved to be really the most meaningful part of it was landing on the research of the neuroscience of addiction. And and that really helped me understand that it was by doing something different in the moment of having an urge that was going to pave the way to different behaviors by rewiring my brain, so to speak. Um, And so I really became very hyper-focused on not following that urge voice that would pop up in my mind and I would ignore it. And it became something automatic eventually. Uh, Urges started to dissipate in frequency and intensity and they stopped entirely um, after a period of time. That was months. Um, And to the point that you raised earlier, um, with other addictions, it's more straightforward. I also quit smoking and that was more binary. You know, I mm-hmm. essentially followed a similar method, but not lighting up is much easier than having to sit through a meal and deciding, okay, this is food I have to eat for sustenance. Right. So I'm going to have to eat this. I can't exclude food from my life, but it's going to be triggering to me. So you have to, you know, really it's, it's harder to recover from an eating disorder than to, to quit smoking. Um, and, and, you know, research backs that is, but it's also um, similar methodologies that that we use. So essentially, I you know recovered using what became eventually Juniper, and we did extensive research before launching our um, prototype uh, with 500 participants. And I asked them, and in eating disorders, you know the the willingness to change is really really high. So with you know there's a high inte- a high willingness to change sure. um, in most cases with people with disordered eating and eating disorders, and so they're really looking for resources to support them. With the treatment landscape today, you know in in many cases um, your best option is an appointment once a week with a therapist. That is not affordable to to everyone, but um, that would be the gold standard treatment, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. What we did in interviewing all these participants was we knew they had spent towards recovery. We knew that they really wanted to get better, and we knew that they were not getting better. And so the number one question we had for them was, why? Why are you not getting better despite the money you're putting towards it and the effort level? And we got versions of the same answer, which was, it's never at noon on a Wednesday when I'm with my therapist that I have a problem. It's every moment around that. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so it really became clear that that in the moment intervention for urges, which we you know had the hypothesis was going to be the big driver of outcomes of better outcomes, um, was the way to go. And so we launched a, an early version of Juniver, ran a pilot, got um, a great result. Ninety two percent of those who tried Juniver were overcoming urges successfully, and then built the app that is available today. And I think that what we're seeing amongst our members and also with clinicians that we work with is that it's also really helpful in complement to um, treatment. So to your point on higher levels of care, there are certain cases where it's absolutely needed. But in those cases, you know, the discharge program is really important to get right because you're otherwise thrown back into a world with little right. support. So um, having something like Juniper or a program that's going to hold your hand when you need it most is, is, is meaningful. Totally. And then yeah. yeah, I love that. I was just going to add that, you know, that's exactly why we structure components of the fitness fix the way we do, because I, I talk to my clients multiple times a day, every single day. And it's because the questions that you have Yes, we can set up time for us to have those regular check-ins and conversations, but like the real decision-making process and like those micro decisions that lead to the patterns and behaviors that we're looking to change, that's the Friday night at six o'clock when you're going out to dinner and you're like, hey, I'm not sure what to order from this menu. Can you give me some guidance on it and actually give the person the education around like, why are we choosing this? And the way I always approach it too is like, great, let's have this conversation by first starting off with, tell me what you want to eat. Yeah. And then we can go from there and unpacking like, what is the, you know, good, better, best kind of like level yeah. of choices based on the goals that we've set for you. And I love that place, you know, starting with the place of, you know, what is, what it, there's so much fear um, yes. in, in in navigating food, especially when, when it's at a restaurant. Mm-hmm. And so you being there, what a gift. And also what a great way to approach it by starting with, you know, what are you in the mood for? And I love that that's part of the program because it's really about rebuilding that self-trust right. so that you can know that, oh, actually this is what I want. And I, I can go for what I want. Um, I don't have to doubt myself. Um, I will learn what's nutritional value, but nutritional, I will learn um, to, you know, have this balanced nutrition across the day and across my week. But in a moment of being out, I can trust that I can also follow my, my pleasure. Absolutely. And I don't know if there was another point that you wanted to add, if, if I made you lose it by me adding what I just said. No, no, thank you. I, I wanted to also say that we've, um, you know, we all we all wish we had Krista in our pocket, but um, for those who, for those who don't, um, we've built what we call Juni, which is an AI powered assistant. So we've trained. Yeah, this is perfect. Um, this was going to be my next yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. So keep going. Um, and so we we uh, trained an assistant to deliver. Uh, support whenever you need it. And that's through a chat functionality. And it's really personalized to your needs. So that if you're in a restaurant, you can open Junie and say, hey, you know, well, exactly that scenario. I'm not sure what to eat. And then you'll be prompted along the same lines that we've just walked through. Um, So I think, you know, there's a perfect, I'm particularly excited about AI when it comes to compulsive condition, like an eating disorder, Mm -hmm. because in a way it's the great delivery mechanism for it. Yeah. This is one of the coolest, like I have obviously, you know, done my own research on AI. Last fall, I went to a conference that was specific to marketing and how to positively leverage AI to really more so like focus on running your business with more speed, you know, saving in like investment and like expense costs around like video editing and things like that, which is super applicable, of course. But there's this other camp that's like, um, has fears around, let's say, for example, with like personal training that you can go into something like a chat GPT and have like a whole workout program written up for you. And there are kind of like two sides to it. There's the one philosophy of like, oh, this is going to potentially like eliminate the role of a personal trainer. There's the other side that it actually can add to speed. And then for somebody like myself would allow me to help more individuals because I can do it faster, but also remembering that like 
there's still the human touch point of getting the person to do the thing you're asking them to do. So for as much as this functionality may offer the workout program, if any random person goes on there, just because they have access to the program doesn't mean that they're going to go do it. Because if that were actually true, then this would have been a non-issue years ago, thanks to YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, like, you know, there's all those resources technically have already existed, right? So it's still like weaving in that human component that to me, I don't think it can ever fully be replaced. But what I do think is really cool about something like Juni is it does allow more access to be able to reduce the cost of investment for a program like mine, because of course that is always a potential barrier. And I think it's great that it can be trained and customized in that way. And I'm just really excited to hear examples like this because I think there is a lot of like fear mongering around what AI might be able to do. So much to unpack. And also, I think you're at, you know, we're very much in the same camp from what I can tell, which is the complementary beauty of that. You know, you are the accountability that people Mm -hmm. need. So It's not only all the years of expertise that you bring to the table and the ability to know your client to really tailor a program to that, to their needs, but it's also, they, you know, they are more likely to follow through with whatever you agree because you're there in their life. So there's something irreplaceable about that. Um, And to your point, you know, there's also bandwidth considerations, cost Mm -hmm. considerations. So where AI can really fill in those gaps is by supporting people in um, meaningful ways that don't replace human touch, but are certainly getting um, better results than purely self-guided without AI. So we're excited and leaning into that opportunity. And I'll also touch on an important factor, which is, you know, we really take our responsibility very seriously. And when it comes to safety guardrails, we have a lot in place because we know that our population is going to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's been also very much top of mind. Yeah, I think it's really cool. And I think it's very exciting to see that develop. I want to make sure that we also touch on the research side of all of this, because you and I discussed this previously when we first met. And as we know, and I don't know that everybody who listens to the show knows this, but there is a huge gap in the world of nutrition, especially when it comes to the research piece on actually researching women and taking data that are done through studies and clinical trials and things like that that are actually done on the male population and then making assumptions that it could and should apply to females in the same way. And yet we know for so many different biological reasons that actually makes no sense. And I know another big initiative of what you're doing with Juniver really plays into that. So can you just share a little bit more about the research component and what you're doing with King's College and where you you kind of envision that going? Because I think it's really important. Yeah. To set this stage, um, women were excluded from clinical research until 1993. Um, so we know a lot more about male bodies than we do about female bodies. We set out to create with Juniver a data-driven company so that we are able to better understand how eating disorders present across the wider population. What we do know about eating disorders tends to be on the anorexic patients. So the research that has been conducted is largely on those patients, so the minority, 6%. Um, We are really focused on everyone else, the 94% who uh, meet other diagnostic criteria, Uh, And who also, you know, I think in our member base, we have 25% um, of people of color, 25% 25 of our members are people of color, 25% of our members are male. We have a lot of menopausal women in our uh, member base. So just the wide range of, um, of the demographics speaks to how widespread eating disorders are and how misunderstood they are. Mm. So in this clinical trial with King's College, we are measuring the effects of Juniver um, against the EDQ scale, which is the clinical assessment for eating disorders. Okay. Um, and we, we're running a randomized control trial. So it's six a six-month trial with 300 participants, and oh, the outcomes will be published in a paper. That's exciting. Very cool. No, I think that's great. I, Again, like I know you said this at the very beginning of this conversation, but I literally had no idea that anorexic patients represent only 6% of the population. It's when, when I think about disordered eating, like that's just one of the first things that always comes to mind. And the other, you know, the other big part of why research matters is that 
the gold standard treatment, CBT, is only 30% effective for eating disorders. Mm -hmm. So we really need to move the needle there so that people with eating disorders can expect, you know, have a, get, have a better chance at recovery. And we believe that that's through personalized intervention. Yeah. Especially when you put that in the context of all of the data that you received when building Juniver about yeah. willingness to change, like that, that makes almost no sense, right? Like there should not, if, if it's only a 30% e effectiveness and yet almost every person is reporting, like, I don't want to be this way. Yeah. There's clearly a disconnect there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and you know, what's also interesting is that there's so much appetite, no pun intended, for um, contributing to research. I think people have been, you know, facing the difficulties that we highlighted in this conversation of access to care being really delayed. Sometimes people wait eight months to access a therapist that's focused mm -hmm. on eating disorders. Accessing specialty care needed disorders is very challenging. And then you do get care and typically it's insufficient. So, um, you know, they, they've, they've really felt uh, firsthand the challenges of, of, of the limitations and what we know and, and how, how um, treatment is, is conducted. So there's a huge opportunity for innovation. Um, and, it, and I really would also encourage people who are experiencing eating disorders and disordered eating to participate in research, our, our clinical trial, we're recruiting for it at the moment. So um, feel free to join junivertrial.com. Um, there's, there's a lot of uh, work to be done and your contribution, those out there um, who feel seen and heard in what we've discussed, um, your contribution will help advance research. Yeah, I think that's great. And one other thing I wanted to ask you about too, we have yet to, you know, see how much this is going to play out, but and everything we've discussed around diet culture and just, you know, the expectation of looking a certain way. I think there's a big resurgence of what a lot of people are, you know, attributing to like nineties skinny and like that look that is coming through, I'll say misdirected use of certain drugs, like the Ozempics, Monjaro, Zepbound, you name it out there. What are, from what you have, the work you've done, your own personal experience, the people that you get to talk to, what is your take on how that could be manifesting into various degrees of eating disorders, disordered eating? Because I, I have a lot of personal anecdotes from things I've seen from people yeah. I've spoken to about it. Yeah, it's such a big topic. Um, you know, the medication it is, is if prescribed for the right reasons and if it helps people, that's great. Um, we, within our community um, and, 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 and speaking really on, on behalf of people with disordered eating and eating disorders, we had, we had moved as a culture towards um, a place where body positive conversations, you know, health at all sizes, um, that was, helping people with eating disorders and disordered eating to really engage with their recovery productively. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it may be triggering for many to um, see us move back um, as a society towards idealizing certain body types that are in some cases unachievable in healthy ways. Yeah. So that's, that's been our point of view. So if medication is used appropriately and helps, that's wonderful. Um, for those who are struggling today, um, stay focused on what you know your body needs, on what your objectives are with recovery, and try to cut out the noise around you. And it's hard, um, but, you know, limit social media, limit for at least, uh, a, you know, a, a, a period of time limit influences, um, that would not be contributing in helpful ways to your recovery journey. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have transparently clients who do have appropriately been prescribed those drugs. And I've seen in combination with the work that I am doing with them because they are focused on the behavior change. And in most cases, I kind of set like a prerequisite of, hey, can you give me X amount of months, if not years to focus on these behavior changes so that they're really cemented for you? And then let's see if this will add to what you're trying to achieve. And I've had yeah. several of them tell me they're so glad that I took that stance for them because now that they do have this as a part of their regimen, 
it's actually encouraged them to be even more focused on their behaviors because they understand that they might be losing muscle mass and they understand that that is not what they want in terms of being truly healthy and having longevity and like looking at their health long-term. Um, so in a lot of ways where people think it may be this like shortcut, it's actually not necessarily if, you know, used appropriately. And I think the thing for me that I just have like concerns about long-term is in terms of the way some of these medications like actually work, like the mechanisms themselves with slowing digestion and like slowing those gastrointestinal cues, but also convincing somebody that they're very full much faster. I fear like, what does the other side look like when- they are then trying to intentionally increase their food intake because that's where I've started to see just from like personal stories, a totally changed relationship with food because the definition of like what's enough to eat has been just like completely skewed in the opposite yeah. direction. Yeah. So. Absolutely. And, I, and I think that speaks to really the need um, that we see across the board, that these drugs are really powerful, really impactful. Um, and that, wraparound support is often needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that term. That's a great way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. This has been such a fantastic conversation and I really appreciate everything that you've shared with us today. I want to end on a little bit of a more like fun, lighter note, a little bit more about you personally. So we're going to do a little rapid fire of some fun questions. Amazing. Okay. So if you could only eat one food for the rest of your life, just one, it had to be the same dish every single day, what would you pick? Toast with cheese and tomatoes. Nice. Very specific. I like it. Um, Tell us about your workout routine. What do you like to do? Yeah, I do strength training. So I do bar and reformer about three, three times a week. Cool. That's awesome. What's the last book that you read? The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control. Oh, okay. What Which was your I biggest takeaway that. from it? Um, that perfectionism is not necessarily something to curb. You can lean into parts of it and 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 have it serve you. Really cool. What has been the most rewarding part about building a company? The creativity. I've really loved you know, problem solving creatively. It's been, um, it's been a a more creative of a journey than I expected. Dream travel destination, somewhere you haven't been. Portugal, Lisbon. That's become a very popular place recently. I feel like I've heard so many people tell me they're going to a wedding there. I, I would love to, to travel there soon. Cool. Well, last but not least, most important question If somebody could only take one thing away from our entire conversation, and we obviously covered a lot, what would be that kind of like lasting message that you'd want to leave with them? If you want to change your relationship with food, seek help. I love it. And where can everybody stay connected with you? Checking out Juniver. I know you already mentioned the link to join, um, but we'll put all of that down in the show notes too. You can find us on joinjuniver.com and the trial page for sign up to the trial and free lifetime access to Juniver is junivertrial.com. Perfect. Well, Emily, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I really learned a lot. I'm very excited for feedback on this episode. And for everybody who did tune in today, I always want to give this reminder that Sometimes when we're dealing with conversations that might be difficult, and we use this word a few times throughout this one, confronting, sending somebody a podcast is a really good way to start that conversation. So share this with someone else if you think it might be valuable in their life. Of course, go check out Juniper if you think it might be helpful for you. I know I'm excited to integrate it as an option with some of our clients as well, because I think, again, it really complements everything that we're already working towards inside the fitness fix. And I'm so glad there is dedication and access to this type of platform for a very reasonable and accessible price point. I think that was something we didn't come out and say, but it's not even $8 a month. And I think that's fantastic. And I love seeing the ability for us to move in a direction where we can make services like this more affordable. So thank you for contributing to that in that way, because it does make a huge difference. And I'm sure your members say that too, but 
for everybody who tuned in today. We appreciate you all being here. And as always, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll catch you guys next week. Thanks, Emily. Thank you so much for having me, Krista. You're welcome.